Hi guys, today I'd like to introduce Seymour um, with Welp. He is the head of that company um, and we're going to dive into to understanding Welp a little bit more and understanding Seymour. So Seymour, welcome. Thank you for taking the time and doing this. Uh, to start, what I'd like to do is, can you tell me a little bit about you and your company and how you got here? Travis, thank you very much for having me. This is a great initiative and I'm a big fan. And I really appreciate people like yourself that you know take a lot of time from their schedules to help individuals and startups and ecosystem in the big picture Absolutely. to move forward. People like yourself are taking the game forward. My name is Seymour. I'm originally from Azerbaijan and I am based out of Houston, Texas. I started Company Wolf in 2019. The biggest challenge for us was to help companies deliver timely and delightful support over multiple channels. Many people complain about holding for long wait times, here listening to horrible music while they're holding, and if you have something urgent, and then the frustration grows while you're growing. Sure. Our main purpose with Well is to help companies reduce the wait time while delivering timely, and delightful customer support across multiple channels. Okay, so just so that I'm clear, uh, you help with customer support, customer service. I'm assuming you probably have an IT aspect to it as well, because it sounds like the customer service from an IT help desk perspective would be there as well, correct? Travis, you're already doing a coaching, which the coach's <laughs> role is to help elaborate, right? And that's what we do exactly. Thank you for helping me clarify my pitch is that we produce, we have built a product, a software solution that helps companies to integrate it into their existing system seamlessly, that helps them to automate the customer support as well as provide high performance support across their technology channels, correct? Perfect. So that's the role of the coach. Perfect, <laughs> that works. So tell me a little bit about um, what do you attribute your growth to? So, you know, how did Welp get to the, I mean, you are not a small company. Uh, you are a fairly well-known company. I talked to a couple of people uh, prior to the call about Welp and they knew who you were. And so how do you contribute or what do you attribute your growth to? That's very flattering. That's very humbling. Thank you so much. We are we're humbled. We started in 2019. The first six months, we built the product without talking to any single user. And that was the biggest mistake I did as a personal, uh, personal as a founder. So after six months, we went to the customer. The customer said, oh, this looks gorgeous. This looks stunning, but I need something simpler. What we built was a plane, but the customer was looking for a bicycle. Sure. Right, And that you can be proud of your plane, but no one is going to fly it because they don't have a place. So since 2019, we started talking to customers, listening to them. And right now we are actually serving more than 1,600 customers in 36 countries. And the main, I would say the reason for the growth was that they started seeing value. They started seeing value. And we reflected in the product design as well. The product design is gorgeous, like it's eye-catchy, but at the same time, it's functional. There are many things that are attractive, but they are not functional. And then there are things that are functional, but they are very ugly. Our, I think one of our secrets of growing and, and then customers sticking with us is that we brought this beauty which is user interface with the functionality, which is user experience to together and we combine them. So I would say helping customers solve their problems in a user centric and customer friendly way. Okay, very nice. It's funny, I spent almost 20 years in the automotive world um, and I will say, I'm a bit of a sucker for electric vehicles. I think electric vehicles are, they are certainly the future. Um, and I grew up in the middle of nowhere on a farm and I can't imagine electric vehicles working there anytime in the next hundred years. But uh, I think that a lot of companies, and, and you hit on this, a lot of companies wanted to set their electric vehicles apart in the design aspect. And that's one of the reasons that it ended up turning so many customers off 
And then you have someone like Tesla that comes out and actually makes a sexy car that just happens to be electric. And it it served them very, very well. And you're starting to see a lot more manufacturers do the same thing. And it sounds like you kind of did the same thing. You wanted that sexy product that would really kind of stand out and work. And then you had to figure out how to change some of the back end to make it work for your customers. So that's that's fantastic. That's really, really interesting. Um, so, and you've already answered this, but I want to ask it just to see if you get to go a different way. You mentioned that um, in the first six months, you guys built the system, you didn't talk to anybody, and then you got to talk to people and you're like, oof, I might have gone a little too far, whatever. If you had to start from square one in business, in this business, well, again, what would you do differently? Travis, this is such a wonderful question. I do not have a clear answer, but I can work around this. First of all, starting a company is like a layer of cake, right? There are multiple layers. So if you cut the cake from a side and you, you take a side look, you can see multiple layers. One of those layers is talking to customers, getting the customer feedback, valid, validating the idea, why would they use it, why they wouldn't use it. But another layer of that cake is your gut feeling, right? I, I really... I, another mistake that I made, I started listening to the team members, which will sound very selfish here. I started listening to my team members just because I didn't want to look as a bad guy that is so self-centric. Self. But I forgot the fact that the vision I have is totally different what they have. They are a doers. They are not seeing my idea from my perspective how I visualize it as a solution for the customer. So I'll give you a quick example. We were working on the reporting and my product owner guy comes and says, let's do reporting this way. And he says it in a team meeting. And just to not to be a jerk, I say, oh, okay, sounds interesting. That We work around his idea. It turns out horrible functionality or feature, right? Looks ugly, doesn't do the job. And just because I didn't want to be a bad boss, I followed up. I, yeah, I gave feedback. I let it, but uh, the mistake was that I was saying, no, this is how we do it because this is how I have seen in other companies. Mm -hmm. They don't have the experience that you have as a founder because as a founder, you have more exposure, right? If I could do things differently, first of all, I would definitely go with my gut feeling more often than ever. Second of all, uh, listen to customers, but customers don't know what they're asking for until you give it to them. And then once you give it to them, they're like, wow, I love it. And then the third thing is that um, I would start definitely earlier. Like if there are guys or, I mean, of course, if there are people, girl, ladies, gentlemen, listening to us, watching this, uh, and if they are at the age of 17, 18, 19, 20, I would definitely start earlier because that gives you more runway to do a lot of examples, to do a lot of... Uh, changes, modifications, and mistakes. Okay, I think that I think that that's a fantastic example of your exposure to multiple things. You are the driving force behind the vision. I think the next piece that comes into that is is then how do you balance um, employee retention, employee. Um, livelihood with your desire and push of your ideas so you know what is your biggest learning been as an employer since you began in business you already talked about the fact that it is your voice it is your vision and it needs to be executed but as you said how do you sit around the table and make sure everybody has input and you're not a jerk how how do you manage through that it's challenging. You know, people keep claiming that your staff is your family. I disagree with that. They are not. Family doesn't leave for a higher salary, right? Let's just say you are married for 30 years. You have a great relationship going. You know, you got the kids. You love your wife. Your wife loves you. And then another someone comes and says, hey, I'm going to give you, I don't know, like five grand more per month. Can you become my husband? You're not going to do that because... I mean, money doesn't talk in the family. So I wouldn't call my employees family. Yes, we can treat them nicely. They can treat them as nicely. That's a different story. But I'm going to sound, I'm going to give an unpopular opinion here. I think founders 
should be a little bit jerk, should be a little bit selfish, should be a little bit. Um, I'm 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 looking for a nice word. You feel free to edit this. I'm looking for a nice word alternative to an asshole, right? You can be a pain in the neck, right? As a founder, and and that's fine because you have a vision, you have you are a trailblazer, you have a goal, and you have a mission. You're not going to get distracted by some background noise. Of course, others' opinions matter only if they make sense to me. Am I sounding too selfish? But no. that's what it is. What you should do as a founder, you have a vision, you know where you want to go, you shouldn't be distracted by the background. They don't, sometimes, most of the time, they don't know what they're talking about because they haven't been in your shoes, they haven't been in your mind, they haven't seen them. So how do you become, of course, as a nice guy? I would say you can thank for their contributions, right? I appreciate it. And if, if it makes sense to me and I see how it is better than, you know, in terms of the customer satisfaction, in terms of the operations, in terms of the execution, I absolutely take it. If I have a simple bit of doubt, I shouldn't take that anymore. That is the lesson I learned that if you have a heartbeat of hesitation that... I'm not sure how is it going to, no, no, you're not taking it because it's going to be a trial error, waste of time, and gonna, you're going to lose money and time. I think it, it's it's very similar to, to parenting, really. I mean, parents have to be tough on their kids so that their kids go down the right path, but they also have to kind of foster that individual growth. And it's, it's very similar to that. And, you know, I can tell you there are times that we probably all didn't enjoy our parents, but at the end we didn't run away from home. So it's, it's a matter of, you have to be able to set that boundary. And, and I think that clear communication really becomes a piece of that. As long as everybody is clearly communicating and understands what your vision is and how you achieve it, then your, your team, if they have a good idea, isn't going to hesitate to say, Hey, what about this? But at the same time, they're going to understand when you're like, yeah, I don't know how to execute on that, or I don't think that that's the right way to execute. It's perfectly fine. So that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense to me. Um, so one of the things that Action Coach uh, Brad Sugars, who is our founder, talks very uh, frequently about, very highly of, is he believes in reading books. So he actually believes that in reading one book a week, and he will read something um, educational once a week. And he believes that if you do that, then you will always constantly be learning and you will never be dying, right? So I guess my question to you is, if you're a big reader, an avid reader, is do you have a most influential book that you kind of go back to on a frequent basis? Reading is one of the channels to acquire knowledge, right? Now the, the acquisition of knowledge has shifted to podcasts, listening, watching, as long as you get that knowledge, right? In Houston, Houston is a city of highways and I, I'm not a big fan of it. You constantly drive and then to pick up the kid, I drive about 40 minutes and then come back another 40 minutes. So that gives me a good chance to listen to certain podcasts or audiobooks or or as long as you digest, as long as you absorb and, and would acquire knowledge information. The book that I read that still, you know, strikes a chord with me and I really love going back is called Innovation Stack. Okay. Innovation Stack, oh. yes, by Jim McKelvey, who is the co-founder of Square. He, he founded Square together with Jack Dorsey. And the Innovation Stack is such a wonderful book with the ease of language, with great vivid examples, how... He tells the story of the IKEA effect, for, and then how he tells they competed with with Amazon when Amazon decided to kill them with a payment technology, right? And then how they won the game. And he also talks about how Bank of Italy converted into Bank of America, how that vision. So it's a very nice book that every time I go back to it to read few parts here and there, it puts me back on the track of hope. Right, there are a lot of hopeless nights. There are a lot of hopeless days, and it is a. Some entrepreneurs say that entrepreneurship is a roller coaster ride. I wouldn't say it's a roller coaster ride. It's it's more than just a roller coaster ride because ups are so few that it's more of a down coaster ride. Like more, yeah. most of the time you are down here. Yeah, you go up, yeah. and that book 
And that book has the paragraphs, has the chapters that take me up and then I get full of hope and get back to creativity. So Innovation Stack is a wonderful book. I love, it's like a, it's like a self Bible to me. Um, I really liked Essentialism. I read it and I really enjoyed it. Greg McCone, he's a very nice, he has, he has talks as well. And at the same time, uh, which is on my to do uh, to read list right now is the, the messy middle. So the two one that I read and the messy middle is the one that I want to read because, you know, from the idea until execution, there's a lot of messy middle and no one talks about it. everybody talks how the rocket landed how the uh, cars are sexy, how, you know, the square is successful, how Twitter is that, but nobody either wants to see or talks about the mess in the middle. And I think that's where the core is made. That's where you become, that's where you don't die and you become stronger. Right. You, uh, you're right. Nobody ever talks about the, the missed sprints, the, the things that you have to go back and fix because the sprint broke it. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, so let's shift just a touch and go to some different things that you found being a challenge. Um, tell me a little bit about how you balance work and your personal life. You know, running a business, the demands are insane. Uh, how do you balance your personal life with those demands? Travis, it's a very uh, authentic question. And I think if, if, if to be honest on my end, there's no such thing as balance. There's integration. And unfortunately, I'm the wrong person to answer that question because I have spectrums. I have the end of the spectrum. So I, on one end, I am with my kid and I am spending like two, three days with him with a 5% of my time looking at urgent emails, looking at the you know urgent situation or emergencies. But most of the time, Reading the uh, leaving those emails unread so that I can get back. But I am fully with him. For example, this weekend it was Columbus Day. There was no school. He also had a long weekend. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, the kid was off. I have an eight-year-old. So we went canoeing and kayaking, and it was a wonderful experience. Not a single time I was on the email or writing anything or reading anything sending anything i didn't care what we are doing at that moment are we making money are we losing i i, I didn't care at all i was totally with the kid and i personally really enjoyed it as well but last evening i take the kid you know he is ready to go to school and this morning that's that's another sprint for me until the end of friday and that means you know i am fully focused here i'm fully focused here all my notes all my to-dos and the calls and customer meetings, reporting sales, that's it, until Friday. So I will go, I'm going end to end, I would say, which is, so far works for me. It's an individual, I think it's uh, case by case, but there's no balance. I think we can't forget that already. There's integration, there's a better integration, but if someone says, oh, I have this balance, I think it's just blood, it's not happening. Actually, you said something that I hadn't thought of in that way before. And I come from uh, working with a lot of IT. My my spouse is in IT. So sprints are something that's just, I, yeah. I understand. And you just mentioned something that I had never thought of in that way that's really, really interesting. And you treat life as a sprint. You have the home sprint, you have the work sprint, and you just kind of get through those sprints yeah. and I, I like that idea. I had never thought about it that way. Interesting, um, yeah. Let me ask this. What are some of the m common misconceptions about running a business? Um, maybe you, misconceptions that you had about running a business as you came into it. Um, and how have you kind of addressed those as they've come up? Misconceptions is that how you're going to be popular. You're going to be, you know, this, you're going to be successful. You're going to be that. Uh, it's a, it's not. It's a lonely game. I am most of the time alone and most of the time lonely. And I have canceled a lot of dates. I have canceled a lot of, let's just say, friendly meetings just because of work or because of the kid, which was a result of the work that I was not able to be with the kid because of the work. So it's just, it's an it's a domino effect, right? It's a very lonely game. And uh, yesterday it was released, Brian Chesky, Airbnb CEO, his podcast was released. And 
I find Brian such an authentic personality. I love him because he's very genuine. He's very authentic. And I highly recommend to, you know, see that episode. And it's a very lonely game. He also talks about that as well. And that's another, that's one misconception. And misconception number two is that, you know, it's a shiny game. You're going to get all the articles, the tech crunch, you know, that it's not, it's not true. And it's like a very, very, very small percentage of entrepreneurship will get to that. And, and it's not only success, but it's also luck as well. Yeah. And then the third thing is where you come from and who you know really matter a lot. People think that if I have a great idea, oh, I'm going to implement it, I'm going to raise funds. And it, it, um, I would say it doesn't work most of the time. Oftentimes, sure. it's important who you know and where you live, where you come from, what kind of high school, what kind of network, what kind of college, you know, that really matters. The reason I'm mentioning is that I was listening to another podcast by Spotify CEO. He mm -hmm. sold his first business for 1.2 million when he was 18. Now, he is Canadian. You can do that in Canada, right? You cannot do that in Afghanistan. You cannot do that in... I don't know, certain other parts of the world, right? You cannot do that in small town in Argentina. It's not going to happen because no one sees you in the small town. But if you come from a small place in Canada, you have this idea, you put it, it's just, you know, I guess uh, we, we need to learn to be able to count our blessings as long as we have those things and we have that uh, certain. So I would say uh, another misconception is that, yeah, I'm going to do it and it's going to, blow it's gonna expand it's gonna grow this not gonna happen uh, you have to work m way harder much more than you anticipated right and then the last one misconception is that um get rich fast right it's not gonna happen either uh, i realized that nothing literally nothing in life is easy yes everything is simple absolutely everything is simple but nothing is easy. Even like the sim simplest job of, let's just say, I'm just sweeping a street, right? Just, it's not easy. You have to wake up at 4 a.m. You have to uh, handle the traffic and you have to clean. You have to work in the cold weather conditions. It's not easy. It's simple, sounds simple, but it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Anything that people do requires hard work, commitment, dedication, and challenge so yeah I, you we live in a world of instant gratification and so we all think that if we're going to start a company that we're instantly going to become rich and successful and it doesn't happen <laughs> nope it nope. doesn't happen at all and you know what here's another thing Charles. i think people including myself i used to be that like we were constantly looking for something up there when we reach that 10 million or 100 million but we are forgetting the fact that if I am financially independent today, it's because of wealth, right? And it doesn't matter how, it doesn't mean that I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars per day. I am financially independent. I'm not sitting and waiting the end of the month for, yeah. the, for my paycheck to come in, right? I am financially independent. And we do not see this blessing right under our nose. We should be able to learn to count the blessings. We should be able to be grateful for those things. Yeah, I have a, a very good friend that is a life coach. And that is her biggest thing. We even I did a campaign for her a number of years ago that was teaching young kids to live in the moment, right? You and we're all guilty of it. If we're not working, we're on our phones, we're looking at stuff, we're social media, whatever it is. And life is what happens is what passes you by. And, and you kind of nailed that to the T like we have to be able to step back and look and say you know what we're a lot further ahead than we thought we were um we're not living Absolutely. in a car or a box or and you know sometimes that happens too and you've just got to figure out how to get out of it so uh, to finish up let me ask this where do you see yourself in five years and any of the words of advice that you would give other business owners who are looking to grow in five years i am selling wealth 
for 100 or 150 million, we're doing a very good acquisition. That's my goal. We're not doing IPO with wealth. We are going for strategic acquisition. And my valuation for the exit is 100, 150 million target. That's number one. And number two, in five years, I'm actually seeing myself as Jack Dorsey. I love that guy. And I am I built a fintech company back in Baku, Azerbaijan. It was a facial recognition. You could actually pay everything, pay for everything with a smile, simple smile, and then payment would go through. So I believe I'm a big believer of, like you mentioned, you are a sucker for electric cars. I'm a sucker for fintech, and I be, I'm a big believer of universal payment solution that uh, no matter where you go from, you go to, no matter where you come from, hundred dollar bill, paper cash. It's accepted everywhere. Like no one questions what is your password, what is your 3DS, what is the OTP. No one questions that. You go to Nepal, you want to climb a mountain, hundred dollar works there. You go to Argentina, works. There. You go to Chile, you go to Singapore. It works everywhere. Mm-hmm. I want to come up with a universal payment solution that, without any technological barrier, will work everywhere. Because. I personally experienced that problem. My Azerbaijani cards don't work in the US. My New York card, card doesn't work in Houston. My Houston card, Bank of America, doesn't work back home. So I have a lot of issues. So in five years, I want to see that. And what would be the advice to give to those who are you know, starting or in the process of getting hardships? Um, Number one would be that start as early as possible. Start as early as possible. 18, 19, 20, 21. Yes, you can get a job, but try to do something on the side. Number two, always stay humble. No matter who you are, no matter who you become, stay down to earth, stay humble. And and do not show off that you know things, right? If you show off things, if you become arrogant, it's not going to get you anything. It's, it's just going to only take from you. It's going to take the trust. It's going to take the, what do you call the um, connections. It's going to take away from you. So stay down to earth, stay humble, no matter what you are or how big you become. And the third thing I would say, always um, being able to filter the incoming feedback. Right? Feedback is a gift. People will give you feedback. Sometimes you will ask for it. Sometimes you will not ask for it, but people will give you feedback. But being able to filter that feedback and apply the things just like body does when we put food inside, right? It takes the necessary things and it pushes out the unnecessary things, right? And take the necessary parts of that feedback and reflect on them. Learn to reflect on them. If feedback not being reflected is just a piece of air, piece of word. So those would be the things that I personally uh, learn, and I'm also experiencing. And I'm I'm living by them. Like I am living by them. Like, I take the feedback. I appreciate the feedback. And no matter what is happening with wealth, I always say that it has. It's not me. It's the team. We're doing it all together. And at the same time, I wish I had started way earlier. So I am teaching my son. Uh, I'm like, hey. You know, you could start a lemonade stand. You know, you can sell this idea. You can sell this to me. Make a Lego, sell it to me. So things like that with the the entrepreneurial or business mindset. So these are the things I would leave the audiences with. Perfect. Seymour, thank you so much. That's going to wrap up our interview. Um, But thank you so much for your time.